Hello, and welcome back to Felony Spectator. I am your host, Heather. On today's episode, we're talking about the Chelsea Brug case. Chelsea disappeared after leaving a huge Halloween party on October 26, 2014. Chelsea Brooke was the youngest of five children with three sisters and a brother and lived in a small town called Maybe, Michigan. Her mother was a very devout Christian, so she grew up in a very reputable home. She was an employee of Oga's Kitchen at the Mall of Monroe and had aspirations of being a professional chef. At the time of her disappearance, she was going to attend Monroe Community College, and friends would say that she was outgoing, very sweet, and generous. On October 25th, 2014, Chelsea attended a Halloween party with friends in Frenchtown Township, Michigan. And this party was huge. Despite the party being in a small town, the host, known as Big Mike was a huge fan of Halloween and would host an annual party on his mother's acreage. Big Mike also played in a heavy metal band called Pickaxe Preacher. And part of the appeal of this party was that Pickaxe Preacher would be playing alongside several other heavy metal bands during the party. In 2014, this party was a lot bigger than normal. Typically, he would anticipate about 400 people, but this time upwards of 800 people, some accounts say closer to 1,000 people, showed up. This also meant that a lot of people from other towns showed up, new faces and strangers. Big Mike tried to keep the party somewhat organized and usually hired security, had parking attendants, but it was pretty wild in 2014. There was also reports that there were several people kicked out for fighting and the street started to get clogged with cars because the party was just overflowing with people. Now, Chelsea had gone to Big Mike's Halloween parties before and she always had a good time, so she wanted to go again. So Chelsea and some of her friends from Olga's restaurant, Laura and Rebecca, as well as a friend named Penny, planned to go to Big Mike's party. Chelsea would dress up like Poison Ivy from Batman. She spent weeks sewing fake ivy leaves onto a green leotard, and she was said to be really, really proud of her costume. She had also worn black tights, a purplish wig, and red Mary Jane style shoes to complete the full look. And she even hoped she might even win one of the prizes for best costume. Now, Chelsea didn't drive at all, so she was going to drink. It said that Chelsea went with Laura to the party and they arrived around 10 p.m. From most accounts, Chelsea didn't get overly intoxicated. She was drinking wine from a large jug labeled poison, but she wasn't sloppy or falling down all over the place. Just after midnight, the bands had stopped playing and most of the people now were just hanging around a really large bonfire. Mike had to temporarily leave the main party area to go out onto the street in front of his house to get people to move along. Then before 1 a.m., Chelsea's friends were ready to leave, but they had lost Chelsea. Being that there were so many people at this party still, it was really hard to find her. Chelsea also didn't have her cell phone on her because it didn't fit in her Poison Ivy leotard. Some podcasts are reporting that Rebecca or Becky had been carrying Chelsea's cell phone, but I read that Laura testified saying that Chelsea's wallet and cell phone were in her car. Some accounts are also reporting that it was Penny's sister who finally said that they had to leave because Penny's sister had to work the next morning, so they couldn't spend any more time trying to find Chelsea. Assuming Chelsea was hanging out with other friends, they just thought that Chelsea could get a ride from someone else. So Laura gave Chelsea's belongings to Rebecca and Rebecca took them home. So at this point, all the girls had left the party without Chelsea. Sunday morning, Rebecca left a message on Chelsea's home phone at her mother's house to say that she had Chelsea's phone and wallet and Chelsea could come by any time to get them because she was going to be home all day. But Chelsea didn't show up. Sunday night rolls around and Chelsea's sister would send Rebecca a message on Facebook saying her sister still wasn't home. I guess after messaging back and forth a little bit, they assumed that she was with a different friend and she would probably be home later. Finally, on Monday morning when Chelsea still hadn't come home, her family would call around to friends asking if anyone had seen her. They also had to make the difficult decision to finally call police and report her missing. 
Family even messaged Big Mike at this point in desperation to locate Chelsea, hoping maybe she fell or got stuck somewhere on his acreage. Big Mike hadn't seen her, and he didn't even know who she was because the party was so huge. So the family asked if he could check his fields just to be sure that she wasn't out there. Mike did. He tried to look around, but his dog had hurt its paw, so he had to cut his search short and carry the dog back to the house so he could take it to the vet. When he arrived back at the house, Chelsea's mom was there waiting. Mike let her know that he didn't see Chelsea, but he had to go to the vet. He offered that she could stay if she wanted, look around, but they would talk when he would get back. When he did finally get back home from the vet, he saw over 15 people all searching around his property. Now, Mike didn't really like that so many people were walking around his property, but he realized that this must have been a much bigger deal than he originally thought, so he let them carry on and actually tried to help them as well. Not long after, they ended up setting up tents, they brought in generators, and committed to having a very large and very thorough search of his property. This wasn't the police who organized it, it was the family. So technically, they were all trespassing. Big Mike didn't like it. They were violating his privacy, and having them set up camp was more than what he bargained for. So he had to consult with his attorney. The attorney said he could ask them to leave and he didn't have to cooperate, but if he had nothing to hide, he should just let them continue the search, which he did. He let the search happen, hoping that they'd quickly get some answers and move on. Unfortunately, Chelsea's mother would confront Mike and accuse Mike of hiding Chelsea somewhere, and she started to get quite emotionally charged. Media also started showing up, and Mike was starting to be treated like the main suspect, which was really bothersome for Mike. He was trying to be understanding and helpful, but just because he hosted a Halloween party, He was being treated like a criminal. The search would spread out into the community as well, and more than one million flyers and posters were printed and handed out to the public, asking if they knew or saw Chelsea. The details were to look out for the Poison Ivy costume. She was blonde, average height, average weight, and wearing red Mary Jane-style shoes. A $17,000 reward was offered, which was later increased to $30,000 in hopes for any information. About six people from the party came forward and said that they had spoken with her at some point during the morning hours of the party. They all claimed that Chelsea had seemed really upset and crying at times because her friends had left her. She was also asking people if she could use their phones to call for a ride home. It said that Chelsea had borrowed a phone and had gotten through to Penny and asked her to come back and pick her up. Penny refused, unfortunately, saying that she was too drunk to drive and that Chelsea needed to ask someone else for a ride home. Chelsea didn't call her mom or got through to anyone else that the police were aware of. Another woman came forward saying that her son spoke to Chelsea at the party. Around 3 a.m., Logan Matsall, who was selling band merchandise with his mother, spoke with Chelsea and specifically remembers her because he talked about her costume and had told her that he was allergic to poison ice. Logan also remembers that Chelsea was upset. She said her friends had left her, she was cold, and she wanted to go home. There was also a man with her, and this man didn't say anything to Logan, but he kept putting his arms around Chelsea and acting like he knew her. Chelsea and the man would walk away together when the conversation was over towards the parking lot, So Logan assumed that they knew each other and he was taking her home. The description of the guy with Chelsea unfortunately sounded like a lot of guys from 2014, with that long swooped over hair and thick black glasses. He was also average height and average weight, and nothing about him stood out. Police would release a sketch of what they thought this man may look like. The problem was that nobody knew if this really was what he looked like or if this was part of a Halloween costume. The police interviewed most of the people who resembled the sketch, including some of the band members, but they all had alibis and it didn't lead to any additional useful tips. Big Mike was still the only suspect at this point. So police would get a warrant and searched Big Mike's entire home. They ripped apart his house, they searched the fire pits, the fields, and came up with absolutely nothing. They also asked Mike for him to volunteer his DNA, but after he consulted his attorney again, he refused. He stood by his innocence and said that he didn't do anything wrong and he didn't want his DNA in some big database for criminals. 
because he wasn't a criminal. Police were now stuck because they had no idea where Chelsea could be until a man named Harlan Bird called in saying that he had information that he needed to share. Police asked Harlan to come down to the station and talk. So his story was that while at the party, he witnessed two men harassing a woman in a poison ivy costume pushing her back and forth in the parking lot, calling her names until she fell down, and Harlan rescued her. He described Chelsea perfectly. Harlan allegedly helped her off the ground and had inadvertently got a small drop of blood on his shirt because the girl he had saved had rested her head on his shoulder. What Harlan didn't know was that Chelsea had bumped her nose on a tent pole before midnight, so it was very possible that it was blood from that. Police were very intrigued by Harlan's story. He then said he sat her in a red four-door car that was left unlocked. It was not his car, just a random car that was unlocked in the parking lot. Then he went back to the party to get help. 10 minutes later, he returned without help, but the red car and Chelsea were gone. Unfortunately, Harlan's girlfriend had washed his clothes from that night, so the blood was probably gone. Police pressed him for more information because it was weird. Why stick her in a random car? Why didn't he call the police? Harlan's inconsistencies almost seemed like he was responsible for hurting Chelsea and was hiding hiding something. So police continued to press him further. Did you take that girl and no. do harm to her? No. Did you take that girl That's and her? No. Did you rape her? No. Did you kill her? No. Harlan denied hurting Chelsea and started to get a little upset, realizing that he was now a suspect. He would finally confess that he made the whole story up. He lied to make himself look good. This is nothing but a big lie that I shouldn't have done. I'm sorry. Harlan would be arrested for lying to the police. After Christmas passed, just two weeks into 2015, Carrie Carr would phone police to say that her ex had allegedly confessed to killing Chelsea and dumping her body in or near a cemetery in Toledo. She was scared of her ex because he had threatened her life and told her not to tell anyone. She was really worried he would kill her if he found out it was her who told police. Oh, I was trying to get in my car. Okay. Pulled out a knife, okay, a packet knife. Okay. And then he goes, this is the one I use on Chelsea. He like grabbed me by my shirt and he had a knife and he goes, this is what I used with Chelsea Brooke. He didn't say that her name exactly. What did he, what he did he said, say? This I need is to what I used that. on Chelsea. Okay. Don't make me use it on you. Police would speak with the ex and he immediately said no. He suspected his ex right away and that it was a huge lie just to get him in trouble. Carrie would be spoken to again and sure enough, she admitted that yes, it was a lie to get her ex in trouble. So just like Harlan, Carrie was also arrested for lying to police. These people who lie to police really waste a lot of time and resources in finding real information. Thankfully, they were arrested for lying, but it just puts the whole investigation on hold when stuff like that happens. It wouldn't be until March of 2015 when police got new information. Sherry Retzlaff called police because she had found a red Mary Jane style shoe beside the road at the edge of her property. Sherry had a 3.5 acre tree line property on a busy road. So every spring, she would go out and clean up the side of the road because there was often a lot of debris that gets tossed during the winter. Normally, it's a lot of garbage, sometimes hubcaps. She has found shoes before, stereos, bottles of booze, and other odd things, but most of the time, it just all goes in the trash without a second thought. It was Sherry's husband that remembered the red shoe on a flyer he had recently seen and suggested that they call the police just in case. The following day, Chelsea's mother would identify the shoe as one that Chelsea was wearing. So police would start searching the roads and ditches to see if they could find anything else. Not too long after the discovery of the shoe, Eric Kassab called the police because him and a friend were in an old abandoned building looking to collect scrap metal for money when they found something they think belonged to Chelsea. 10 miles from the party, they were in a half-collapsed building when Eric flipped over a large piece of plywood 
and saw what he thought was a plant, which was very out of place. Beside the plant, he also saw a purple wig next to it. Eric picked up the plant and realized that it was actually a costume. He originally put it down and left, not realizing what it was. A week later, he saw a poster of Chelsea and sort of put two and two together, but he was nervous to call police because he had picked it up and his DNA would be on the costume. Eric's sister encouraged him to call the police. The costume had been collected by police and they would notice that it was ripped at the shoulder straps and the crotch area. Police would send the costume to the lab to see if they could get any DNA off the leotard. Strangely, this building that the costume was found was about 100 yards from where Harlan Bird lived, so Harlan would be brought back into the police for further questioning. He agreed to a polygraph and giving a DNA sample. He passed the poly, but police kept him on the radar because polygraphs aren't always reliable. And what are the chances that this guy who allegedly made up a story and called in with a tip lived right across the street from the dumped costume? Sadly, on April 24th, 2014, Chelsea's body would be found deceased. John Marcon had recently started doing some work on a lot about seven miles from the property. He was clearing trees and gonna be building a house on this lot and had driven his dump truck to unload some extra fill when he got stuck. He hopped out of his truck, walked to the back to see how stuck he was and assess the situation when he noticed a body. Police came to check it out and the body was almost completely skeletal at this point. It was also apparent that the body had purposely been covered by broken branches and small logs in an effort to hide it. What gave it away that it could be Chelsea was that near the body was one artificial ivy leaf, which basically confirmed that it was Chelsea. The following day, dental records would confirm that the remains were indeed Chelsea Brooke. Around the same time, the lab that Chelsea's costume had been sent to had determined that there was men's DNA on Chelsea's leotard. They ran the DNA through their CODIS system, which is the system that the FBI has for cataloging criminal DNA. Unfortunately, nothing came up. The DNA had cleared Harlan and Eric, but not Big Mike because he hadn't provided his DNA, so he would still be a suspect at this point. John Marcon called police back a few months later because he had now found a woman's red Mary Jane style shoe and tights on his property as well. Police would go and collect those as well, but it still didn't give them anything further that would solve their case. Medical examiners had since ruled that Chelsea died from blunt force trauma to the head. She had numerous fractures to her face, a severe broken jaw, neck fractures, teeth fractures, and many fractures around her orbital bones. It was apparent whoever killed Chelsea had beat her relentlessly. Sadly, police still had no solid leads, and it wasn't until almost two years later did they finally get something. The crime lab finally got a DNA match on Chelsea's case. Someone had recently been arrested and their DNA came up as a match to the DNA on Chelsea's leotard. This man was named Daniel Allen Clay. Daniel is from Newport, Michigan, and was living with a new girlfriend at her house when he came up as a suspect. Usually he was a bit of a transient, typically unemployed, and had a criminal record for things like battery, theft, and credit card fraud. In May of 2016, Daniel and another man were arrested on larceny charges for accosting a woman in Monroe. They stole her backpack full of expensive tattoo equipment. Luckily, a new law in Indiana had passed in 2015 that allows DNA to be collected from anyone who was arrested from the previous law that DNA could only be collected from people convicted of a crime. This means they don't have to be proven guilty in court to request DNA anymore. So when Daniel was arrested for stealing this backpack, it was enough for police to take his DNA for their database. When investigators looked him up, there were two outstanding arrest warrants due to unpaid child support from two different women. At this point, police didn't have an arrest warrant for Chelsea's murder, so police decided to go ahead and arrest him for the child support warrants with the plan to further question him on Chelsea's case. On July 22nd, 2016, police would find Daniel at Kelly Richter's house, his girlfriend's house, in a French town mobile park. Daniel tried to run out the back door to escape, but luckily he ran right into the arms of the cops instead. Kelly would come home at some point and she was extremely cooperative with police. She allowed them to search her home 
and they would find Chelsea's underwear, jewelry, and some of her other personal belongings. When Daniel was finally questioned about Chelsea, he lied. He admitted to being at the party for a few hours, but had no idea who Chelsea was. He had never met her and never noticed a poison ivy at the party. He also couldn't remember who he was with at first, and then he said he went by himself. He also said that he was with his baby mama the entire time. It was really hard for Daniel to keep his story straight. He went on to say that he was a lover and not a fighter. He loved women and wouldn't hurt anyone. He also bragged about being a ladies' man and trying to pick up girls at the party. But Chelsea wasn't one of them. She wasn't his type. Police would confront him with the DNA, and he finally admitted that, yeah, maybe he had met her, but he still had no idea how his DNA got on her because he didn't hurt her. He then changed his story to Chelsea hitting on him. She had approached him, and they had sex in the car, but... He didn't leave with Chelsea, he left alone, and she went back to the party. That's how his DNA got on her. Investigators would tell him that it wasn't his semen that they found on her costume. It was skin cells that they found on the shoulders and crotch, presumably when the costume had been ripped off her body. Being that the costume was ripped off, she probably didn't walk back into the party with her torn costume. He continued to play dumb. They also lied and told Daniel that Chelsea had a disease in which her bones were very fragile. He then finally said that Chelsea had asked him to choke her and slap her during intercourse because she wanted it rough. He did what she asked, but only after about 15 to 20 seconds of choking her, she went completely limp. So it must have been her bone disease that killed her, not him. Daniel didn't know that the bone disease thing was a lie. Investigators made it up to try and get a confession, and it worked. Daniel did admit that an ex-girlfriend once passed out because he was choking her, but that was years ago, and he doesn't do it as hard now, so there was no way he would have done that to Chelsea. He then kept saying how drunk he was, and he really didn't know what happened. In interviews with ex-girlfriends, they all said that Daniel loved to choke them during intercourse, and he was very rough with them. One of his exes named Erica admitted that she didn't feel safe around him because he often took it too far to the point where she would get seriously hurt. One time he broke her rib from pushing down on her chest area too hard during intercourse. Daniel thought that when Chelsea passed out, he tried to perform CPR, but he couldn't revive her, so he freaked out. He didn't know what to do, so he drove around for more than a half an hour. He didn't call authorities, and out of desperation, he left Chelsea in the wooded lot. Daniel then claims that he stayed with Chelsea's body and cried because he was so upset by what happened. He also added that he had no idea how her clothes ended up in an abandoned building 10 miles away. Unfortunately, medical examiners couldn't confirm if Chelsea had been strangled or not because her body was far too decomposed. But to them, it was more likely the blunt force trauma. To them, it looked like Daniel had beaten her to death. Police would later learn that the girl he was dating at the time of the party said that Daniel told her the day after the party about a girl that went missing. The odd thing was Chelsea wasn't missing at the party. Chelsea's mom didn't call police until the evening of the 27th. So nobody would have known, except for her close friends and family, that she hadn't come home. Definitely not Daniel. Police would also see on his Facebook profile that he would post or share multiple links regarding organized searches for Chelsea. He had added to his events on Facebook, October 29th and 31st, searches for Chelsea. On November 29th, he added another Find Chelsea event to his Facebook. In April, he also shared news articles the days that her costume were found, and then again when her body was found. So for him to say that he didn't know who Chelsea was was a complete lie. And his fascination with sharing events and news on his Facebook was also a little disturbing. Daniel pled not guilty because he stood by the fact that it was accidental. His story slightly changed again to that he had seen her walking down the road alone carrying her wig, and he thought to offer her a ride. They would drive down the road a little bit before he pulled over, and they had sex, which was consensual, in the backseat of the car. Again, he only choked her for maybe 20 seconds. The medical examiner spoke at the trial and said that a person wouldn't die after 20 seconds. A person might pass out at about 30 seconds, but constant pressure would need to be applied for over two to three minutes for death to happen. 
If she was only passed out, then she would have been alive when he dumped her in the woods. However, her injuries point towards a vicious beating so badly that she wouldn't have survived. At the trial, it was also revealed that the costume was not removed until probably after she died because inside the costume, it was covered in blood. This means she was most likely wearing the costume while she was being severely beaten. So she was most likely either close to being unconscious or completely unconscious or dead when he ripped the costume off of her to have unconsensual sex. Daniel did testify, but he never fully admitted to killing Chelsea. Instead, he said things like, I know I did it, but I don't remember. All I know is we had sex, but I don't know how she got the other injuries. I don't know how her costume came off of her, which were all complete lies. Daniel Clay was charged with felony murder and concealment of a body. During the time that Chelsea's murder was being investigated, Daniel was assaulting other women. And during Chelsea's trial, he was also found guilty on other sexual assault charges where he walked into a woman's apartment, struck her in the face, yanked her off the couch, and raped her. Chelsea's mother told the courts that she forgave Daniel for killing her daughter. She would give Daniel a Bible during the sentencing, and she let him know that she'll never forget what happens, but that she forgave him because that is what God would like her to do. Daniel thanked her and said he was sorry and he would keep the Bible as long as he could, and acted like he understood what she was going through, even though he never once admitted any guilt or showed any remorse for what he did. The judge wasn't so patient, and he called Daniel a liar, a rapist, and a killer. Daniel has tried to appeal, and I won't go into that because his reasons are really kind of pathetic and he's really grasping at straws. My thoughts? Despite the fact that I do deep dives into a lot of criminal cases, and I read a lot about the worst of the worst, people like Daniel Clay always get under my skin. The fact that there is men like this walking around the streets, beating women, raping women, as well as killing women is extremely disturbing. I feel like these men aren't all that uncommon either. Women go missing all the time. It's really quite scary. With that said, don't leave your friends at parties and don't let them wander off with people that they don't know. Sadly, I don't think there is a cure for people like Daniel. And unfortunately, it's not easy to get rapists locked away either unless they kill their victims like Daniel. My heart goes out to Chelsea's family. She sounded like a really sweet girl. I'm sorry to hear what she went through and I hope there's some healing for them. And for her friends too. I'm sure they're living with some major regrets. That's it for today. Thanks again for joining me here at Felony Spectator, and we will see you again soon.